This week's Parsha podcast is dedicated in loving memory and Le'ilu Nishmas Elchanan Nachum Ben Yitzchak, the father of a dear personal friend and a dear friend of Torch, Eitan Merwis. May his soul merit a spiritual ascension in heaven. We are up to the book of Bamidbar, the book of Numbers. And the first Parsha, this week's Parsha, Parshas Bamidbar has 159 verses. It's one of the 17 Torah portions that don't have any mitzvos. And as we shall see, it has a very different tenor than the book of Leviticus. It begins, Hashem spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tent of meeting, on the first of the second month in the second year of the Exodus from the land of Egypt. So it's been a year since they left Egypt, and the Almighty gives Moses the following instruction. Take a census of the entire people, according to their families, according to the father's households, by the number of their names, every male according to their headcount, from age 20 and up. So this is a census that needs to be taken from the whole Jewish people to find out how many males there are broken down into tribes and to families. Now, the obvious question is that, of course, the Almighty does not need to count the people. He knows, of course, everything, everything about everything, and there's no reason for him to have us, have Moses, have Aaron do a human-based census when he knows the answer, exactly how many people there are. So Rashi addresses this question. Rashi tells us that this is an expression of love. Whenever someone counts something and counts it repeatedly, it's a sign that they really value that, they really love it. And therefore, says Rashi, that just as when they left Egypt, they might have counted them, and when they sinned in the golden calf, they might have counted them again. Similarly, over here, the Almighty is showing how much he cares for them, how much he loves the Jewish people, and therefore he counts them yet again. And one of the themes we'll see, if you look at the Hebrew words of counting, it doesn't say to lispor, which means to count. It says se'u, which means to uplift, which is a euphemism for counting. But one of the themes of the Parsha is the idea that the, that the nation is being uplifted. It, it's, it's, it's been given stature. And when we're being counted over here, it's not to minimize or mitigate the individuality, to just get the total number. Rather, it is to get each person to achieve a certain pedestal, a certain achievement, a certain stature, and to be valued as an, as an individual and to be counted by Moses and by Aaron. So, for example, in the United States, every 10 years, there's a census, and we have to count the people. And the objective of that is, of course, to figure out how many people live in each state and how many people live in each, in each district and how many people live in the whole country. And we count votes every time there's an election. But if you understand the the essence of, of how we count here in America, it's not about accentuating the role of the individual. It's, in fact, the opposite. It's to find out how many people are in total and we're just counting numbers and everyone is really equal. So if you have two votes and one of them is a professor – with advanced degrees, and the other one is is someone homeless who has no degrees and no experience and, and, and doesn't know anything about the subject, their votes are, are equal. Whereas over here, we see that Moses and Aaron, the leaders of the people, are meeting each and every individual, the Jewish people, asking their name, asking them about their family, finding out who they are, what they're like, getting to know them, and giving them stature, uplifting them and assigning them with, with a place, with a prominence amongst the Jewish people. Now, how were they counted? Rashi tells us that everyone would give a coin when they met Moses and Aaron. They would, they would give them a coin, and the coin would be put into a special bucket of that tribe. And then you know the total of people by counting the total of the coins, and the total of the tribes by counting how many coins are attributed to each tribe. Now, we're told that it's only from the age of 20 and up. So Rashi tells us the reason for this is because the age of 20, that's when people go to war. And that seems to imply that we're counting the amount of soldiers the Jewish people are now about to move out of the confines of Mount Sinai. And they're going to encounter uh, enemies and they have to fight them. And therefore, it makes sense. We're counting the soldiers to prepare for battle. And when does that start? It starts at the age of 20. That's how Rashi understands what's happening over here. The Ramban, he quotes Rashi and he explains the reason why the age of 20 is the time when someone goes to war. That's when they start hitting their, their peak strength. But he adds an alternative explanation as to why we count from the age of 20. And he suggests 
then maybe what it means that the people go out, it means that they are convened when the nation gets together. What happens at 20 is someone achieves like adulthood, and when the nation gets together, they join. And maybe, you know, for us, what it's telling us is that maybe our expectations of teenagers is a bit premature. Even by the Torah standards, when could you expect someone to be part of the normative, the mainstream society? That's only at the age of 20. Maybe that's a takeaway. So from the age of 20 and up, anyone who goes out to the legion in Israel, you shall count them according to their legions, you and Aaron. So this is a very important point here. You know, in in America, we have a census, and that's done by bureaucrats. It's done by paper pushers. And here, in fact, every individual is coming with the families and with their children and identifying themselves and giving a coin. Shouldn't that be done by someone other than Moses and and Aaron? Moses and Aaron are the most important people, the busiest people, the great leaders. Why specifically Moses and Aaron? Why are they the ones in charge of this census? So the Ramban kind of echoes the point we spoke about earlier about uplifting the, the nation. And he describes, he says, you have the holiest Jew, the greatest prophet, his holy brother. God speaks to them directly. And think about how powerful it is, what a merit it is when the masses come and they get to meet them. And Moses and Aaron would pray for them and would bless them. And they would give a coin, that coin would be used for the coffers of the temple, for the coffers of the tabernacle. Well, that would be an atonement for them. And he adds that they wouldn't just say, oh, how many kids do you have in your family? Let's write this down so we can move on to the next person. Every individual would have an opportunity to have a one-on-one meeting with Moses and Aaron. And that, of course, uplifts the nation. It's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And it's something, it's an inspiration that will live on in their heart for forever, in effect. And, you know, our nation, we've had a history of, of great prophets. And the role of a prophet is to uplift, to be a, to, to be, to serve the nation, to be the intermediary between the nation and, and God. And my grandfather used to quote from the Gona Vilna, who said that when there was prophecy amongst the Jewish people, people wouldn't need to break their head to find out, what do I need to do? What does God want from me? What's my personal mission in life? You just the prophet. And the prophet would look at you and would see the root of your soul and would know exactly what you need to do and how to do it. And it it's unbelievable for us that all the uncertainty that we have in our lives in a time where there were prophets, that uncertainty would not exist. And here, the whole nation, they come to Moses. Moses is able to look into their hearts, to know what advice to give them, to know what guidance to give them, to give them a blessing. And that experience uplifts the nation forever. So then it lists in verse 5, the heads of the tribe who are going to be coordinating to be with Moses and Aaron counting the individuals and lists the names of the 12 leaders of the tribes, the 12 princes or presidents of the tribe that are there to help facilitate this counting. Now, it's interesting, even though we have 13 tribes in effect, because you have the 12 sons of Jacob, but then you have the tribe of Joseph that was split to two at the end of Genesis, when Jacob is about to die, he tells Joseph, that his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, are going to be like Reuven and Shimon. They're going to be uplifted a generation earlier. So in fact, we have 13 tribes, but the tribe of Levi is going to be counted separately. So all we have is the 12 tribes, not including the tribe of Levi, and then we have the tribe of Levi is counted separately. So everyone gathers together the entire assembly in the first and the second month, and they establish their genealogy according to their families, according to the father's household, by the number of names from 20 years and, and up, according to their head count, as Hashem commanded Moses, he counted them in the wilderness of Sinai. So verse 18 here, there's a little bit of a different explanation as to what exactly this means when it says they established their genealogy. So Rashi tells us that this was proof of pedigree. 
when people will come and say, I'm from this tribe, I'm from that tribe, they would have to bring evidence. That would be documentation. They would have to prove that they are indeed part of that family, part of that tribe, and to be able to attribute themselves uh, and, and their pedigree to that particular tribe. The Ibn Ezra, he has a different understanding of what this means. He explains that this was a way of proving not pedigree, but age. Almost as if you would bring your birth certificate to show that you are indeed 20 years old and therefore you are included in this counting. Now, verse 19, it says that Moses did this exactly as Hashem, as the Almighty commanded him. And the obvious question is, is that, is that really necessary to, to tell us? Of course. God instructed him to do it and he did it. So obviously he did it as God instructed him to do. So it's been suggested that maybe there's another reason why Moses would count them. After all, they're about to embark on a journey towards the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, and they're going to be facing their enemies. And it's very important for Moses, the leader and the military leader of the people, to know how many soldiers he has. So maybe you may say that Moses had some personal reasons for wanting to count the people. He wanted to do it because he knows he has a military encounter upcoming. And therefore the Torah says, no, as Hashem commanded Moses, it, the only reason why that Moses did it was because the Almighty commanded him. He did not add any own personal motivations of why he maybe would want to do that. The sole purpose was the instruction of God to the exclusion of any other objective. And then the Torah goes on to list the final tallies of each one of the tribes. So Ruvain was 46 thousand five hundred, Shimon fifty nine thousand three hundred, and so on. The tribe of God was forty five thousand six hundred and fifty, uh, Judah seventy four thousand six hundred, uh, and so on, all the tribes. Now what it is really interesting that every single one of the tribes is a round number. So for example, Dan sixty two thousand seven hundred, Asher forty one thousand five hundred, Naphtali fifty three thousand 400. It's all very round numbers. So is this random or not? So some have suggested, you know what, that's just the way it was. It just happened to be that all of them were round numbers. 11 of them, by the way, are numbers that are rounded off at 100. And only one, the tribe of Gad, has 45,650. All the numbers end with a zero, uh, most of them, 11 of them, are uh, hundreds, and one of them ends up with a 50. So it's been suggested that Moses, after all, is counting them, but we know these are only soldiers. And therefore, maybe it's being broken down into units of 50 or platoons of 50, and therefore, yes, there were odd numbers, but vis-a-vis the, this particular counting, that you're counting them with relation to 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 military strength, it is rounded off to the nearest 50. Alternatively, another answer that I heard was that it's rounded off to the nearest 100, and therefore, if it was closer to 100, let's say it was a 75, it was rounded up, and if it was 25 or 22, it was rounded down. And the reason why the tribe of Gad is exactly 50, because... The number was precisely 45,650, and because it's 50, it is exactly equidistant between 100 and 0, and therefore there's no way to round it off, and therefore they gave the precise number, 45,650. So these are several answers. Maybe it just happens to be that was, that was the precise number. It's hard to imagine if it was random, but who knows? Alternatively, it was rounded up to the nearest 50, or maybe it was rounded up to the nearest 100, but Gad, because the tribe of Gad was exactly 50, which is not closer to 0 or to 100, therefore they just gave the precise number. Okay, so we counted the tallies of all the tribes, and the final number, these are the countings that Moses, Aaron, and the leaders of Israel counted. This is verse 44. 12 men, each, each man for his father's household, were they, they were all, these were all the countings. What's the final number? 603,500 and 50. The amount of males from the age of 20 and older was 603,550. And then it adds in verse 47, the Levites, according to the father's tribes, were not counted among them. 
And then the next verse, we say, okay, now it's time to count the Levites. It's a little bit of an unusual continuation here. In verse 47, we're told the Levites were not counted. And then 48, we're told, Hashem said to Moses, but you should not count the tribe of Levi, and you should not take a census from among the, uh, from, of them among the children of Israel. But now you appoint the Levites of the tabernacle, and eventually they're going to be counted in, 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 the, in, the, in the parsha. So it's kind of odd. It says in verse 47 that the Levites were not counted, and then in verse 49 it says, don't count the Levites. The Ramban explains that Moses was unsure whether or not to count the Levites. God told him the names of the 12 heads of the tribes who are going to aid him in counting the nation, but he did not designate to Moses who should lead the tribe of Levite, and therefore Moses inferred from that that he should not count the tribe of Levite. So verse 47, it says that Moses didn't count them because he implied from what the Almighty told him that indeed the Almighty did not want the tribe of Levite to be counted, and he didn't count them. Whereas in verse 49, that was the instruction specifically to not count them, uh, and therefore it looks like it's repeated, but it's not. Now, why are the Levites not counted amongst everyone else? So Rashi gives us two reasons. Reason number one is that because the Levites, they're the legion of the king, they are designated to be together with God, they're counted separately. It's almost as if, you know, these, the whole nation, of course, we're a kingdom of priests, we're a holy nation, we're God's chosen people, but the clergymen, that's the Levites. And therefore, the Levites, they have to be separated from, from everyone else. They have to be designated as being the legion of the king, and therefore, they're not counted together with everyone else. That's the first reason that Rashi gives us as to why the Levites are not counted amongst the rest of the Jewish people. The second reason is really interesting. The Almighty foresaw that there's going to be a decree on all the people that are going to be counted from the age of 20 and up that they're going to die in the wilderness. Right now, we're a year in to the story of the Jewish nation. It's been a year since they left Egypt. And the assumption is that they're about to go into the land of Israel. That's the assumption. But we know that it ended up taking 40 years why? Because they sent spies, scouts, to go investigate the land, and they brought back a negative report, and the people believed the report, and as a result of the 40 days of the scouting mission of the land of Israel, the Jewish people were condemned to spend 40 years wandering in the desert. And here we find out that God knew this, of course, ahead of time. And he knew that all the people that are being counted right over here in the beginning of the book of Numbers, chapter 1 of Numbers, all those people are not going to make it because they are going to be part of the nation that believed the report of the spies. And therefore, God says, I don't want the Levites who didn't participate in the sin of the golden calf, I don't want them to be included in the number of people that are going to be counted and are eventually going to participate in the sin of the spies and are going to die in the wilderness and not make it to the land of Israel. So the problem with this Rashi is that what does being counted amongst the nation, how does that lead for someone to sin in the sin of the spies to be condemned to not go into the land of Israel. Isn't there a different way to avoid the Levites dying? Can we say, hey, don't sin with the sin of the spies, and therefore you won't be condemned to to not go into the land of Israel, to die in the wilderness? So maybe we can suggest that when someone is counted together, when someone is united, they develop a certain kinship, a certain camaraderie, and therefore, if they were counted amongst the rest of the nation, it's quite likely that they may have sinned in the sin of the spies. Whereas, if the whole nation was counted and the Levites see the entire people, everyone's going in front of Moses. It's a huge convention. Hundreds of thousands of people are having their meeting with, with Moses and with Aaron. And the Levites, they're not invited. And later on, they say, okay, now it's your time. Now it's the, you're the legion of the king. You're going to be counted separately. 
you're special. You're even more special than the rest of the Jews. That's going to uplift the Levites to a higher level. And therefore, when everyone else is about to sin, they're going to say, no, 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 this is not for us. We're not part of it. We're not participating. And ergo, consequently, they're not going to be condemned to die in in the wilderness. Okay, so the Levites are not going to be counted initially. But instead, God tells Moses, now you appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony, over all its vessels, and over everything that belongs to it. They shall carry the tabernacle and all its utensils. They shall minister to it. They shall encamp around the tabernacle. When the tabernacle journeys, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle encamps, the Levites shall erect it. An alien who approaches shall die. What it's telling us is that Moses is told here by God, don't count the Levites, but appoint them for important jobs of maintenance of the tabernacle and uh, carrying the transporting, etc. So what's the judge's the position? You know, what does not being counted have to do with being appointed with jobs related to the tabernacle? So I think according to what we've said till now, that counting is a way of giving people stature of uplifting them, of recognizing the value and the role of every individual, Moses is being told here by God, don't count them. Don't give them this distinction and stature. Give them a higher one. Not only do they have the status of a Jewish person, they have a task that was assigned to them by God, God has asked them to do something for him, so to speak. You're in charge of the tabernacle. You're in charge of maintenance of God's venue, God's place in this world. And I think for us, we could say more more broadly that, you know, we are the Jewish people. It's almost as if the Almighty is partnering with us. The Almighty wants us to be his representatives in this world, almost like we're the Almighty's ambassadors, We're his people here. We're the ones who are given his responsibility. What an amazing stature that the Almighty is asking us to do things for him. Chapter 2 tells of the formation of the Jewish people, how they encamped. They encamped according to their tribes, and they were each given banners and flags to identify them. Hashem spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, The children of Israel shall encamp each man by his banner, according to the insignias, according to the emblems, according to the coat of arms of their father's household at a distance surrounding the tent of meeting, shall they encamp. So what this tells us is that each tribe has a coat of arms, an insignia, an emblem, a flag that was color-coded for the tribe's stone in the breastplate. So in fact, the commentaries here go through tribe by tribe, the exact color of the stone in the breastplate of the high priest and the corresponding color in the flag of that particular tribe. And it had an image in it. It had some sort of emblem on it that was actually tailored to the specific qualities of the tribe. So for example, we're told that Judah, on the flag of the tribe of Judah, it had an image of a lion. On the flag of the tribe of Reuben, it had an image of a man. On Ephraim's flag, there was an image of an ox. On the tribe of Dan's flag, there was the image of an eagle. Now, those four tribes, Judah, Reuben, Ephraim, and Dan, those were the heads of the four groups, the four quadrants, each comprised of three tribes that each took one side of the entire camp. And these four images are not random. If you look at Ezekiel chapter 1, we read about the vision, the prophecy of Ezekiel, and he sees four images, these same four images, the lion, the man, the ox, and the eagle. Now, there's a famous midrash here that says that at Sinai, the Jewish people saw angels accompanying God, and they were bearing flags, and the Jewish people coveted. We too want flags. We too want banners. We too want to have an emblem that represents our role in this world. And the Almighty acquiesced. And this, I think, is a continuation of the theme of the parasha, that we're being uplifted. We're given a role, a distinction, a stature. We're being inspired. We're the tribe that can 
proudly brandish and wave our flag that represents our mission, our role as a people, and our role in partnering with God and accomplishing uh, what why we were put on this on this earth to accomplish. So we have these four groups of tribes that are all surrounding the middle, which is the tent of meeting, meaning the tabernacle and the Levites. Now it's interesting. We know that this is happening a year and two weeks after the Exodus. And the question is, if the Jewish people are being broken down into tribes, well, we know that when they left Egypt, they left 12 tribes. Like the Midrash tells us, that during the splitting of the sea, the sea split into 12 navigable, 12 walkable paths, one for each tribe. So they were already broken down into tribes even before they left. So how come the distinction of who goes where and who's given which flag and what emblem is on which flag to which tribe, how come that only happens now, a year and two weeks after the Exodus? Why was that not done earlier? So I heard an amazing answer that the tabernacle was erected about a year after the Exodus. And the tabernacle, of course, goes in the middle of the entire encampment. And the problem is that if someone has a flag, of course, the flag is going to evoke a certain feeling of pride or maybe even a certain feeling of envy. You know, look at my flag. I, I got this flag and they have a much better flag. And why don't we have as nice of a flag or why don't we have as important of a role as that tribe? And each tribe could say, well, I'm better than you because look at the flag that I have and you comparatively have a much more minor role. And therefore, maybe the reason why the tribes weren't given their individual role and distinction until the tabernacle was erected was as a way to mitigate the potential competition and clashes that could result from each tribe taking pride in their role in their flag. Once you have the Mishkan, once you have a tabernacle at the center, each tribe could say, yes, I have a role, but it's all there to facilitate the Mishkan, to facilitate bringing God into the world. It's almost as if uh, I read some time ago that there was a poll amongst football players, the American football, not the not, not soccer, and they asked the football players, you know, there's 22 different positions, 11 on offense and 11 on defense. So which one of those positions is the most important? So they polled the players, and I think 70% of the players agreed that the quarterback – that's the most important position. But the quarterbacks themselves, they said, no, no, no. It's the offensive linemen, which are the really big burly guys that protect the quarterback. That's the most important position. And I think, you know, this is maybe like an analogy for, for this idea. Yes, every tribe has a different role. And we read about amongst the commentaries, they tell us the role of Judah and the role of the Levites and the role of Dan and the role of uh, Yisachar and Zavulon. Each Tribe has a role. But when you're working as a team, when everyone's trying to achieve the same goal, the same aim, the same ends, and you have a different role than I do, but ultimately our objective is identical, then there's no room for competition. So once you have the mission in the middle, and that, of course, symbolizes the ultimate goal of the entire nation, each one of us has a different role to play in this bigger tapestry, but we're all working towards the same aim, well, then there's no room for competition. And therefore, the flag, yes, they're there to remind you of what particular role you and your tribe have, but it's not as a way to either flaunt your status over your neighbor uh, or as a standalone siloed off responsibility. It's part of the collective whole and it's there to achieve the, the, the end game, which is, of course, represented by the Mishchan in the middle. Now, the Ramban here, he speaks about the role of flags amongst the nation. And he theorizes that the 
nations of the world, they stole the concept of flesh. They plagiarized, so to speak, from here, from the book of Numbers. And we know that there's always a bannerman, someone who is carrying the flag. And if they die in conflict, someone else has got to pick it up. And uh, we say we die for the flag and we stand for the flag and we pledge of allegiance to the flag. And that's an idea that's seemingly similar to what we have over here. But it's it's different. The Ramban explains that by the non-Jews, the concept of the flag is about national pride and national honor. But there's no – there's not necessarily a meaning behind what the imagery is on the flag. Whereas over here, when we have a flag that's given to us by God, God says this is the color and this is the image and this is the meaning – that is almost a reflection of divine oversight, divine providence, which is on a much higher level. Okay, so we're told here the encampment of the tribes of Israel. It begins with Judah. Judah's encamped on the east, and he has the tribes of Yisachar and Zevulon together with him. Now, if you'll notice that it does not say by the tribe of Zevulon. It does not say and the tribe of Zevulon. It just says the tribe of Zevulon. And the Balaturim, he tells us that we know that Zevulon and Yisachar, Issachar, were a team. Issachar was the Torah scholars and Zevulon were the moguls, were the business people. And they would have an agreement. One would study, one would do business, and they'd split the benefits of both. They'd split the material benefits of the business earned by Zvulun, and they'd split the spiritual benefits earned by Yisachar. And therefore, it doesn't say and the tribe of Zvulun to indicate that these two, Yisachar and Zvulun, are actually a team, and Zvulun is no less than Yisachar, because when they have this agreement, the zavulun yisachar agreement, it is totally equal. They're almost two halves of one whole. Incidentally here, when it says uh, all those counts of the camp were 186,400, meaning the total number of the tribes of these three tribes of Judah and Zvulun and Yisachar is 186,400, and they shall be the first to journey. So Rashi tells us how the journey works when the cloud would leave, would depart. The priests would blow on trumpets. And then initially the tribe of Judah would start its travel. And then you have the second tribe of Ruvain. And then you have the Levites and all their paraphernalia in the middle. And then Ephraim in, and Dan, uh, Ephraim in the west and Dan in the north. Now, incidentally, we find out over here that Judah is the first for everything. Just like when they encamp, Judah encamps first. When they travel, Judah travels first. When they offer sacrifice, and that's Parsha, we're going to read about the sacrifices of the princes of the tribe. The first tribe that goes is the tribe of Judah. And then when they go out to war, in the book of Judges, we read about Judah going first. And uh, Rabbeinu B'chai here tells us that even in the future, when Messiah comes, of course, Messiah is a descendant of King David, who comes from the tribe of Judah, and he too will be the first one to bring us the good tidings of the Messianic era. So it lists the tribes one by one. You have the first encampment of Judah together with the tribes of Issachar and Zvulon in the east, then you have Ruvain, Shimon, and the tribe of Gad in the south. Ephraim together with Menashe and Benjamin in the west. And Dan together with Asher and Naphtali in the north. And then you have in the middle, of course, the Levites together with the tabernacle, together um, with the, what's, what's considered the uh, almost as if the, the, the camp of, of God. And then we read in verse 32, these are the counts of the children of Israel according to their father's households, all the countings of the camps according to their legions, 603,550. Now that number may sound familiar because that's the same number we had in chapter 1. When they were counted, they were counted and that same identical number appeared, 603,550. So why is it repeated only a chapter later? So Rabbeinu B'chai tells us that initially the nation was counted. And then it talks about when they traveled from the Mount of Sinai 
on the 20th of ER, which is 20 days later. So they were counted on the first day of ER, and then they started moving 20 days later. And when it lists the total in verse 32 of chapter 2, that the total was 603,550, that is 20 days after the first counting, which was the identical number. And what it's telling us is that despite the fact that we're we're talking about a nation of hundreds of thousands of people, no one died in those 20 days. The same amount of adults that were present on the first day of the month were present on the 20th of the month. Now, for someone to survive 20 days is not, not a big deal, but for 603,550 people and none of them to die within 20 days is indeed a miracle. Perhaps you may ask, well, how come there were no new people that were added to that tally? After all, I'm sure there's someone who turned 20 during the course of those 20 days. The answer is that for the sake of this counting, it was only people that were that had turned 20 uh, the previous year, meaning anyone who's in, within a year you're counted as, as 20. It's not by the date of your birthday, but by the year. And therefore, there was no new people being added to, being added to the tally for, up to the following year. And miraculously, over the course of 20 days, no one fell off, no one died, and therefore it's repeated. Okay, and chapter 3, we read about the counting of Moses and Aaron and the rest of the Levites and their appointments. So it begins, These are the offspring of Aaron and Moses on the day Hashem spoke with Moses at Mount Sinai. And it tells us these are the names of the sons of Aaron. The firstborns were Nadav and Avihu, and then we have Elazar and Itamar. Of course, Nadav and Avihu, they died in the book of Leviticus. Now, what's interesting, Rashi tells us that in verse 1, it tells us these are the names of the children of Aaron and Moses. And when it starts listing the kids, it only lists the children of, of Aaron, not the children of Moses. So Rashi tells us, quoting from the Talmud, the book of Sanhedrin, that... Yes, it's only talking about the sons of Aaron, but because Moses taught them Torah, it's as if he birthed them. And therefore, Moses taught the sons of Aaron Torah that he received from Sinai, and therefore, it's almost as if they are attributed to him. He's like their spiritual father because he taught them Torah. The Arachim, one of the other commentaries on the uh, on the Torah, tells us, Another reason why Moses is considered the father of the sons of Aaron, and that is, according from a Midrash, that really when Aaron's two sons died, all four of them were supposed to die. And this is leftover, so to speak, from the sin of the golden calf. Aaron was somehow complicit with the golden calf, and therefore his children were condemned to die. But Moses prayed and was successful in sparing two of Aaron's four sons. And therefore, Moses is almost like the father of those two sons because he prayed for them and he assured that they won't die. And then once the Torah mentions Nadav and Avihu, it goes back to their story. Nadav and Avihu died before Hashem when they offered an alien fire before Hashem in the wilderness of Sinai and they had no children. But Elazar and Itamar ministered during the lifetime of Aaron, their father. So it tells us, again, the story that we read about in the last book, in the book of Leviticus, on that view, they died, they brought a foreign fire, and they didn't have any children. So the Talmud tells us that when it says they died and they didn't have any children, what it's hinting at is that if they did have children, then they wouldn't have died. Because when someone has a child, even though when they die, their life, their biology, their DNA still exists in their children, and therefore they haven't really died. Whereas the two elder sons of Aaron, Adav and Avihu, because they died without children, they truly died. That's what the Talmud says. Now, my grandfather, blessed memory, he says a very deep idea. He he suggests that when it says over here, it kind of mixes a bunch of things together. It says the sons of Aaron brought the alien fire, they brought the, the fire that was not requested by God, they had no children, and they died. What is the connection between the alien fire that they brought and the fact that they had no children? So my grandfather suggests that having children is the best way to some for someone to improve their character. Because when you have your own children, it's very easy for you to see their character flaws. And when you see that, it's not such a big leap to understand where that came from. As they say, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. 
And therefore, it's a way for you to kind of internalize your own flaws. The flaws that you see in your children are your own flaws. And therefore, a very deep idea, very scary idea. Maybe we can suggest that Nadav and Aviyah brought a fire on fire because they didn't have any children, i.e. because they didn't have children that would have helped them perfect their flaws, they were flawed enough to have made this sin. Okay, so uh, Hashem spoke to Moses saying, this is verse 5, bring near the tribe of Levi, have it stand before Aaron the Kohen, and they shall serve him. This is the idea that we spoke about earlier, that the Levites are going to be appointed to have a role in the in the tabernacle. Now, they're not going to do the service. The service is designated exclusively for Aaron and his children, even though Aaron is from the tribe of Levi, but he was uplifted to a higher level. He's a Kohen. He's one of the priests. It's only for Aaron and his children to do the work in the tabernacle. But the maintenance, the singing, the ushering, other activities that are needed for the maintenance of the tabernacle that was done by the Levites. And of course, at the end of the parsha, the Torah is going to delineate the exact responsibility of each one of the Levite families. And then we read that the Levites are going to be uplifted to this stature, but the stature that was originally the role of the firstborn. Hashem spoke to Moses saying, Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel in place of every firstborn, the first issue of every womb amongst the children of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine. The Levites, the entire tribe, is going to be uplifted to a exalted spiritual status, the status that was previously occupied by the firstborn. Now, why were the firstborn, why were they belonging to God? For every firstborn is mine. This is verse 13. On the day I struck down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified every firstborn in Israel for myself, from man to beast, they shall be mine, I am Hashem. So the firstborn were acquired, so to speak, by God during the plague of the death of the firstborn, and now that status is going to be conferred or transferred, assumed by the Levites. Why did the firstborn lose it? Because they participate in some way with the sin of the golden calf, and therefore the Levites, who did not participate in any way, they're going to assume that role, they're going to supplant the, the firstborns, they're going to be gods, and therefore this transference is going to have, to have to happen, the role of the firstborn is going to have to be transferred on to the Levites, and we'll read about that in a little bit. But first, we read about the census of the Levites. They weren't counted initially, now it's time to count them. Hashem's what the Moses in the wilderness of Sinai is saying, verse, four, verse 15, Count the sons of Levi according to their father's household, according to their families, every male from one month of age and up shall you count them. Whereas the rest of the Jewish people are counted from the age of 20 and up, the Levites are counted from the age of one month and older. And then Moses did what he was told. Moses counted them according to the word of Hashem as he had been commanded. So there's an extra few words here that Rashi uh, seizes upon. Moses counted them according to the word of of God. So who counted them? Did Moses count them? Or was this done in according to the word of God? Did God tell Moses to count them? So it's an amazing Rashi here. When I read this Rashi every year, I get a little bit emotional and I really want to make a bumper sticker out of this Rashi because I feel like the, the, the lesson is so important to remember. So Moses is told by God, go count the Levites and don't count the 20 year olds. Don't even count the toddlers or the, the teenagers, adolescents. Count them from the age of one month. So if you have a baby that's six weeks old, Moses has to count them. So Moses, Rashi tells us, asked God, how am I going to enter into their tents to know how many suckling babies they have there? I'm going to have to find infants. How am I going to know how many infants there are in every Levite household? So God responded, Asay ata shelcha, vaani e'ese sheli. You do your responsibility, and let me, I will do my responsibility. So Moses went and stood by the entrance of every tent. And then once Moses went as far as he could without barging into someone's private home, then the Shekhinah, God's presence, spoke to him from inside that tent and would tell him how many babies there are in that tent. And therefore, it was, Moses counted them 
according to the word of Hashem. And I think this, this line, Ase Ata Shalcha, Vani I think this is, this is everything that we need to, need to know. It's our job to do what we need to do and the things that are out of our control, that's not our responsibility. That is his responsibility. He will do his job. So it lists the three sons of Levi by name, Gershon, Kahas, and Merari, and it counts the amount of people in each one of these tribes. And then it lists what their role was. Because like we said, the Levites are going to be responsible with the maintenance and the transportation of various parts of the tabernacle. So it begins with the family of Gershon. It counts how many people there are and it lists their responsibility. What were the particular items of the tabernacle that they had to transport? The charge of the sons of Gershon in the tent of meeting was the tabernacle, the tent, its cover, the screen of the entrance of the tent of meeting, the curtains, and the screen at the entrance of the courtyard. These were the things that they had to carry. And then it goes on to talk about the family of Kehas, uh, counting them and what, what what was their responsibility. They had to carry the ark, the table, the menorah, the altars, and the sacred utensils the partition, and its accessories. There's a very interesting Rashi in verse 29 where it tells us the location of the children of Kehas. Even though the Levites were in the middle, but even within the Levites themselves, where were they amongst that camp? So it tells us that the children of Kehas were on the south side of the middle camp. And Rashi does the math and tells us something very fascinating. That was next to the tribe of Reuven. Reuven was, they were in the south. And we know in a few weeks we're going to read about the mutiny, the rebellion of Korach. Korach was, was, was from the family of Kehas. And his co-conspirators, his fellow mutineers, were from the tribe of Reuven. And Rashi tells us, woe to the wicked, woe unto his neighbor. Rashi does an amazing insight here that the family of Korach was actually situated next to the Reubenites, and therefore they, because there was wicked people here, they influenced their neighbors uh, to the negative, and therefore they both, unfortunately, woe to them, they both sinned in terrible ways and were punished uh, as a result. And then we read about the third family of the Levites, the family of Merari, and how many people they had, and what parts of the tabernacle they were in charge of transporting, uh, the, the planks of the tabernacle, the bars, the sockets, and all the utensils, and all its accessories, the pillars of the courtyard, the sockets, their pegs, and their ropes. And then it tells us, those who encamped before the tabernacle to the front, before the tent of meeting, to the east, were Moses and Aaron and his sons, guardians of the charge of the sanctuary. It tells us the tribes of Judah, Yisachar, and Zvulon, tribes that exemplified the Torah scholarship, the, the paragons of righteousness, they were next to the family of Moses and Aaron. And here's the exact opposite. Instead of saying, woe to the wicked, woe to the neighbor, praiseworthy is the righteous and praiseworthy is their neighbor. And then finally, verse 39, we read about the final tally, the final counting of the Levites, from the age of one month and on, it was exactly 22,000. Rashi tells us that really it was 22,300, but those 300 people were actually firstborns themselves who did not have to assume holiness because they already were holy and therefore they're not counted vis-a-vis how many firstborn are going to have to transfer their holiness to Levites. Now, it's really interesting, the Ramban asked an interesting question. We know the Levites, they were the holiest, they were the clergy. And the rest of the tribes, on average, we have about 50,000 adult men per tribe. And that's only from the age of 20 and on. And here the Levites, more righteous than any of the tribes, and we're counting them from a much earlier age, from the age of one month, you would imagine they would have at least 50,000, probably 70, 80, 90,000. Yet the whole tally is only 22,000. And he asked the question, it's, it's kind of a, a wondrous thing that – The closest tribe to God, they were the ones that had the fewest amount of people. What's the explanation for that? So he gives a fantastic answer. He tells us that we know that the Levites were the one family 
that were not enslaved in Egypt. Why? They were the clergy. They never initially started working for Pharaoh, and therefore they were not, they were never enslaved. And he tells us that in chapter 1 of Exodus, we read that the more the people were pummeled, the more they were punished, the more they were enslaved and tormented by their Egyptian overlords, the more God made them proliferate and increase in numbers. And therefore, he says that the tribe of Levi, they propagated their population swelled at normal rates. And at normal rates, when you have, you know, the head of the tribe Levi and 200 some odd years later, you have about 22,000 people. That's normal. The rest of the tribes, they were subjected. They were subjugated. They were enslaved. They had to suffer tremendous torment. And therefore, God said, I'm going to give them extra blessing. And therefore, they had extra children in their population grew in supernatural numbers. Alternatively, some have suggested that we know the Levites, they did not have any portion of their own land of Israel, and they were supplied by the tithes of the rest of the nation. And therefore, it's been suggested to not increase the financial burden on the nation, the Almighty assured that the Levites would not become too numerous. Okay, so verse 40, we read, that every firstborn male of the children of Israel has to be counted, and they're going to be swapped for for the Levites. And if you do the math here, you end up with 22,273 more firstborn males than Levites. So you end up with 273 firstborns that don't have a Levite to transfer their holiness onto, and therefore they have to pay with five silver coins, which goes to the priests, as it happens today, when you have a firstborn, they still have holiness, but they still have to transfer it away. They have to kind of buy themselves back. They're owned by God, so to speak, and they have to buy themselves back. And they do that by redeeming themselves and giving five silver coins to the priests. Rashi tells us this was done on a lottery system, that every firstborn had to pick a number out of the hat, to pick a piece of paper out of the hat. Some of them had said, Ben Levi, the son of a Levite, and some of them it says five shackles, five silver coins, and therefore no one could complain that there was any sort of impropriety or chicanery happening over here. Okay, the final chapter of our Parsha, chapter 4, tells about the various items that need to be transferred by the Levites. So now, the only ones that are able to carry the items of the tabernacle are people that are between the age of 30 and the age of 50, people at peak optimal strength. Your role as a Levi begins when you're a baby, but it matures when you are 30, and that's when you are capable, that's when you are fit to carry the items of the tent of meeting, the items of the tabernacle from the age of 30 to the age of of 50. So it lists who carries the ark and the various covers that you have to have for the ark. And the Ramban points out that there's extra covers for the ark. Uh, one for, you have one cover for rain and one cover for distinction. Again, like we read about in uh, the end of Exodus and the beginning of, of Leviticus, we have all these various items in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, and they're all uh, disassemblable to be able to be transported and then erected again at the new location of the encampment. So this is talking about when you travel, you have to take them apart, disassemble them. That was done by the the priests. They take them down and then they they package them into specially made uh, covers and transportation bags and things of the and things of the like and they are transported and how exactly they are transported so the 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 table for example has a blue wool cover on top of that you put various vessels of the table you covered it with a red wool cover and all the commentaries explain the, the the symbolism and the meaning behind the various covers and wrappings that are given to each one of the items of the tabernacle we read about the transportation of the menorah, of the golden altar, which is the incense altar, the various uh, paraphernalia of, of holiness. And then we read about the outer altar, which was called either the stone altar or the outer altar or the copper altar. And Rashi tells us something very interesting that we know there was a fire on the outer altar at all times. And even when they moved the altar, it was done with a fire still on it. And there's a prohibition against 
these Levites from touching any of the items that they were transporting. And therefore, read in verse 15, Aaron and his sons shall finish covering the holy and all the holy utensils when the camp journeys. And then the sons of Kehas shall come to carry it so that they not touch the sanctuary and die. Or she tells us that if they do touch it, then they would die. And then it lists what Elazar, the son of Aaron, has to carry. He has to carry the oil for illumination, the incense, spices, the meal offerings of the continual offerings, and the anointment oil. The Ramban makes the calculation, and he tells us this is actually very, very, very heavy, maybe like a thousand kilograms worth of items that have to be carried by one person. And he suggests that he was like Jacob, just like Jacob was able to push over that stone that you needed a team of shepherds to do. He's able to do it by himself. And he was given that special power by God. And the lesson for us is, is that if someone is given a load, is given a responsibility by God, he is also given the power to bear it. And then the Parsha concludes that there's special precautions that are needed for the family of Kahas. They're the ones who are transporting the most prestigious, the most holiest of vessels. And it's very important that there's a certain rotation of who gets to carry it because what's going to happen if there was no rotation, everyone would fight over, I want to carry the ark, I want to carry the ark, and then they're going to lose their seriousness alternatively. Then they come to touch it and they're going to die. You may want to do something that's holy, that's a special responsibility, that's a special mitzvah, but don't do it in a way that's going to cause a fight or in a way that's going to you being pious on someone else's expense. They asked the great Reb Moshe Feinstein, they asked them, what should someone concentrate on when they put on their talit, they put on their their fringes, their prayer shawls in the morning? What, what should you concentrate on? So he told them, you should concentrate on not swiping someone else. When you want to wrap yourself in your garment, you want to do a mitzvah? Don't do it at the expense of others. Thus concludes the first parsha of the book of Bamidbar, the parsha's Bamidbar. The email address is rabbiwolbeajimo.com. Please consider listening to my other podcast, the Jewish History Podcast, the Mitzvah Podcast, Torah 101, This Jewish Life, Eternal Ethics, the links of all those podcasts can be found in the description of the episode. I work for Torch, an outreach and education organization in Houston, Texas. Our mission is to connect Jews and Judaism. It's entirely funded by the generosity of people like you. Please consider making a donation. The website is torchweb.org. I look forward to hearing from you soon at my email address, rabbiwolby at gmail.com.